So, Father, as always, we just elevate your word. God, we thank you for it always. God, we cherish it. We cherish your restoration, your healing, your correction, your alignment, everything. Ways that are higher than ours, spoken from one who's from the everlasting. God, we just honor your word and thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This, uh, this Friday, we had the Rosh Kadesh head of the month, and if you're, if you're newer uh, here and want to kind of wonder what that is, it's, it's something, I, I don't know how deep into eternity, but at least it would be there present in the beginning. Some of the two feasts that it talks about that will still, that we actually have evidence of happening after this earth are Passover and Rosh Kadesh for sure. Passover at least once, at least once one more time in the realm of eternity, maybe to start off. We don't know for sure. Scripture's a little vague on that, but we know for sure that's going to be there. And Rosh Kadesh is one of those times where you, you celebrate the renewal, how Jesus brings all things. As the month renews, so does the Lord brings renewal into our life. And there's different messages the Lord speaks. And one of the messages that came out of that night, I won't go into all of it, but... Um, Crystal had shared a word about making sure, and I'll just kind of quickly summarize, but basically making sure you spend time in the tent, and the tent meaning, the, te- the tent representing in that time of prayer that she was communicating, the tent of meeting, meeting with God, making sure you spend focused time in the tent. And so a cool part about Brian's testimony is that he had had a hard time sleeping uh, last night, and then he said he felt a, a rumble, a shaking in his room at 8.30, even though he was aware that nothing shook physically, but he felt it, and that's what woke him up, and he came here in response to that because he felt the Lord leading him to come, and so he came, and then that's when the Lord gave him that vision, and there's more meaning to that. He shared a bit of that, but there's, it was something personal for Brian, and the Lord really wants to start doing that, and I know he does, and so I'm just saying as a church, don't forsake time in the tent. Do not do it. I'm telling you, there's something to catch goes with the wisdom that we were talking about, the wisdom and treasures of heaven. But this week, I'm going to be talking about be holy as God is holy. And then next week, it just kind of came apart. There's going to be a part two to it, completely different. Just think of two books on the same storyline, completely different. But this one's going to set up next week. I didn't mean for that to happen until the end of this week. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I got to throw this one next. So we're going to be talking about this. And let, let me say this. Back in, in Scripture, you can see many times in the Psalm, Psalm, uh, Psalms, sorry, when David's writing and different people are talking, that people are excited to go where? They're excited to go to the house of the Lord, right? Humor me with obvious answers. Why would they be excited at that point to go to the actual physical house? What were they hoping when they went into that physical house? Why were they excited to encounter the presence of the Lord? Why? Because the Lord spoke to David and then Solomon repeated it at the temple that this will be the place that your spirit dwells forever, your presence dwells forever. And so when it says, let us go to the house of the Lord, you're excited to step into a physical building. At that point, it was, it was a type and shadow. I'm so glad, as cool as it would have been to live there, I'm glad to realize the picture and the symbolism of everything going into now and, and being able to see what's coming next because of scripture. But they would go there to be excited to see the presence of the Lord. And when they would have to go to the temple... What was the main thing to do? Would you just live life and then all of a sudden just go kind of running into the temple? What was something you had to do before you went in there? You'd have to purify yourself in some way, shape, or form. You had to be holy to step into the presence of the Lord, right? We have that picture of the priests, right? The priests were not holy, and especially if they went in behind the curtain, the holies of holies, you've heard me say this before, they had bells on their ankles, and they were called to, to, to pray and do all this stuff before the Lord, and someone would be outside, Uh, listening for the bells, and if the bells weren't there, it means the guy dropped dead because he wasn't pure enough. And they'd pull him out. They tied a rope to his waist because you had to be holy to enter into the holies of holies. And then the sacrifice of Jesus did something completely different when the temple veil was torn down from the bottom and we didn't die all of a sudden when the presence of the Lord was, I mean, he's always been available because he's omnipresent. But when the presence, that, that, that understanding of the presence of the Lord, when it was made available to all people, people all been just dropped dead. There was something different, right? And so in the same area, so we're going to get into a scripture here. So you have to remember, to get into the temple, you had to purify yourself in some way, shape, or form to step into the temple of the Lord. You wouldn't just do that. But now you and I know, again, humor me with obvious answers, that yes, the Spirit of the Lord is in here today, clearly, clearly. But would the, would, what would mark this, 
the, the acknowledgement of the Spirit of the Lord being in here. If we set up a tent, just so I, I didn't get sunburned, across the street in the grass, if we all just decide to pick up right now and move to that tent right there, just say it was already set up, would the Spirit of the Lord still remain here and not over there, or would the Spirit of the Lord be there? Right. So now, even though we want to come to the house of the Lord, because this is a place that we gather and meet for sure, and it's the, even the history here is absolutely amazing, 150 years, we know that this building alone is not the, 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 the period, the end of understanding that the Spirit of the Lord is here because it's a building. The Spirit of the Lord is here because we have all filled the seats. And we are here as a church. So that's why it says don't forsake. Everyone always says these lines like, oh, I'm good. I don't need to go to a church. You're right. You don't need to go to a church. There's a, but there's a special manifestation of the presence of the Lord when you gather together as opposed to being alone. It's different. And, and quite often that, and I don't mean this as an insult, I'm saying this just as fact, is, but that kind of comment is, imma, is, an, is an immature comment, is an immature in the faith comment that I don't need to be in the church. But yeah, you're right, you don't need to be. It's not a salvation issue. But I'd rather be here encountering a special and unique presence of the Lord that comes and is present when the holy believers come together and gather. You know, and obviously I'm a temple of the Lord too, and so when I come into the own, my own prayer closet, I step in there and I encounter the Lord. But there's something unique when we come together as a body that's different. And if I didn't have access to the body of Christ, would I still encounter the Lord? Yes. Absolutely. But there's something special not to be forgotten. Be holy as I am holy. Let's get into that verse here. So we're going to talk about Peter. We're going to read this first letter from Peter. 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16. Therefore, preparing your minds for action, be sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy... You also be holy in all your conduct. I wish I had underlined that. I meant to. In all your conduct. Since this is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. We're about to go into that. That is from Leviticus, that part that I that, that's bolded. And when you read that, which we're going to read it here in a second, not, not in full because it's a whole few chapters. But the point of that, be holy as I am holy, it was more material things. We're going to if you touch something, if you did, well, I'll just get into that in a, in a second. But we're going to see that was so kind of, this is different because this says you will be holy in all your what? In all your conduct. The way you think, act, react, say. All those things that you do, the way you respond to things, what you allow to rule you, whether it's anger, fear, all, all, whatever it is. Be holy in all your conduct, for it is written, be holy, you shall be holy, for I am holy. We're going to get into that in a second. Holy here is set apart. It's different. Uh, the creators of the Bible Project have an amazing uh, teaching on that, which uh, uh, they, they use the example as the sun. The sun is, is unique. Uh, it brings light. It's, 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 it's separate from anything else. Uh, it brings light to the earth. It's, it's a separate being that we can't, but we can't touch it, but we can come in the presence of the Lord. But you know what I mean. It's, it's, it was a really good understanding. So let's go here. For I am Adonai, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So he brought him out of the land, and obviously you and I are not coming out of the land, so to speak, of Egypt, but you and I are coming out of the land of, of death because of sin, right? And so the Lord has freed us from that, set us free. No longer are we stained. We have been clothed in the righteousness of God. We are going to be clothed in, in, a, in a deeper understanding of the, of the righteousness of God. When we are clothed in clothes of light in heaven... It's going to be absolutely amazing. But right here, for I am the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, be holy, for I am holy. There's a different understanding here. There, they were slaves to humans. Now we are getting out to slaves to sin and death. And there's a different kind of holiness that's required for us as there because the knowledge has changed. We have a revelation of who Jesus Christ is. Back in the Old Testament, this word was a, a very well-used word, unclean, especially in the time of Jesus. Right? So here's a couple things that we can understand. If you touch the corpse of a person, you're un de a, corpse, a, a dead person, you're unclean for seven days. <laughs> Jesus did that, right? We're going to talk about that in a second. If you touch the corpse of a dead person, you're unclean for seven days. If you touch an unclean animal, you're unclean till the evening. And you have to purify yourself. If you touch a person with any type of discharge, you're unclean until the evening. Again. 
If you have leprosy, sorry, you're unclean, right? Keep on going. And this is a big kicker right here. Anything touched by an unclean person becomes unclean. And anyone touching it will be unclean until evening. So this is a big verse to summarize where we're going here when we're understanding the holiness of God. They had to clean themselves, various of reasons. Here's just a couple. But you couldn't go into the presence of the Lord unclean. You had to be clean to go into the presence of the Lord. And there seems to be, if you realize this in this last verse in, in Numbers 19.22, there seems to be a unique situation going on here that the unclean had the power to make what was clean unclean. So if I was unclean and I touched this, and someone was teaching right after me, and I handed this to them. Because I touched it being unclean, if someone clean touched it, they would, be, they would become unclean. And you see this interesting thing that pre-Jesus, the unclean had the power to make clean, the clean unclean. And then Jesus showed up on the scene. And he did the exact opposite. He was clean, and he had the power to make what was unclean clean exactly opposite. He touched the leprosy man. He should have been clean. But how can you call Jesus unclean when the man he touched is now clean? He touched the woman with the issue of blood, right? She should have been unclean. But he had the power within himself. He carried the holiness of God in him that when he, the holiness in him that was God, when he touched the unclean, the unclean became clean. And it was a reversal of what we'd seen previous all the way up until that point. When Jesus touched the corpse of a dead person, whether it was a little girl, he didn't touch Lazarus because he, he, he called out to Lazarus, right? But whenever he healed someone or raised someone back from the dead, he would have been unclean. But he had the power because he was holy. He walked in the holiness of God to bring what clean to an unclean situation and make it clean. He had the power to do it. He totally defied the rules that were present before that what was unclean had the power. Like, look at that last verse right there, right? Anything, I need to go, I can't read that from here. Anything touched by an unclean person becomes unclean, and anyone touching it will be unclean till the evening. Jesus came and totally broke and, 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 and brought a brand new reality to earth that we need to pay attention to. Be holy for I am holy. We're going to lead up to it. This is going to be leading up to understanding. Next week we're going to be talking about how you and I have been invited to share and be not only share, be partakers in the divine nature of God. Think about that for a long time. You and I have been invited to be partakers in the divine nature of God. That's huge. That's not some little... I'm a Christian, let me sit on it until I go to heaven. That changes everything, right? Titus. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of, the regeneration, of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs, heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So we see something here. He saved us. And there's something interesting right here. The washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. You and I have been renewed. We have been born again. A, a, a rebirth has taken part that is not necessarily visible to the naked eye because I'm born again in the spirit and my body still looks the same, even though there's cases that people are born again and their whole countenance changes, right? But for the most part, this body is going to stay the same as I'm born again, but something happens spiritually and it's done by the Holy Spirit of God. There's been a regeneration and a renewal of who I am. The flesh of me is dead and the spirit is now alive and I'm a brand new person, not because of anything that I've done, but because of loving kindness when the Savior appeared, according to his own mercy, we've been washed and renewed and, and regeneration has taken place in our life because of the Holy Spirit. We've been set apart. Jesus, even though he was pure and in no sin, he was washed, right? The Holy Spirit came upon him, and from that moment on, something shifted in that reality that when he went around, he brought what was he brought clean to unclean and it stayed clean something completely different 
And he went to people. People came to him, but it wasn't this whole thing, and you're going to get to it, or I'm going to get to that in a second. It's not like we got to get people to church. Yes, we got to get people to church, but you have to understand the power to make things unclean clean rests in you and I through the power of the Holy Spirit, and it's called to leave the place. We come here to gather, and we encounter the Lord in special ways, but, but the power to, to see things changed is supposed to leave the temple, not come to it. We come to it to gather, and when people walk into this house, can they be healed? 100%. Will they be healed? Yes. But do the chances of someone getting healed, are they lessened? If you find out that someone's sick and you walk with another to the person's house and lay hands on that person, is there any less percentage chance of them getting healed as it is in here? No. Why? Because we're going to get into that. I'm not going to jump ahead. Oh, here's my little notes for this slide. We weren't brought out of the land of Egypt. We were brought out and set free from death, from the death of our sin. We were brought out of sin to partake in the divine nature of God. That's, that, 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 I mean, that's just, I'm going to really be going into that next week, right? But just understand that. What, what does that mean to you? I want you to ponder that. There's homework for next week. Ponder what it means in your heart to be a part of the divine nature of God. It's not boring Christianity. The divine nature of God, if you were to stand in the presence of the Lord before Jesus being unclean, you would die. You couldn't do it in that, in that sense, in that scheme. I mean, the Lord showed up in different ways, and people were there, but there was always a difference, right? A lot of times, people couldn't see the Lord, so who did he send? He sent the angel of the Lord, right? Because that was something that people's eyes could see and not die. The angel of the Lord would show up. Let's keep on going, but there's a different washing I want to merge into. John 15, 3 says this, Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Right, you and I come into this place, we, we, Jesus is the word that became flesh, we witnessed, we hear the word, we haven't seen him with our own eyes, but people have, right, we hear the testimony of the words of Jesus, we believe it, there's something that comes alive in us when we hear these words, we believe the word of salvation that through him, salvation comes, and so we accept Jesus Christ, we have been washed, and when we've been washed in accepting the word, then the Holy Spirit comes and does a work in us, renews us, regeneration takes form in our life and we become a brand new person. They're teamed up together. The Word and the Holy Spirit, they work together. We believe the Word and because we believe the Word, our belief in the Word washes us and the Holy Spirit comes and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and we become a brand new person. Right? And so we're different. Things change for us. In that moment, things change for us. Like I talked about a couple, I don't know when I talked about it, too. Sometime in the past, recent past, I talked about it's okay. Look, we we got to stop expecting perfection as soon as as soon as people are young in the faith or even young in understanding what we have. Because remember, we talked about the church in Corinth. Obviously, there was disorder happening in their service. And what did Paul not do? He did not shut down a move of the Spirit, but he encouraged them to keep on going and just said, "Make sure it's done in an orderly way." Right? We can't be afraid. And I'm not inviting it, but I'm just saying we can't be afraid of things looking a little sloppy on a Sunday morning as we are learning to walk in the Spirit in ways that we have never done before. But we just have to make sure that we continually learn. It's not going to be perfect. The most perfect church service is going to happen when we are in eternity. It will not happen here. And we can't be afraid of it being, uh, uh, look, it's all about the heart. Jesus sees the heart. It's not about our actions. Let's keep on going here and deeper in the understanding. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she may be holy without blemish. We've been washed by the word. The word that he spoke to us, each one of us in this room has heard that word and believed. And a washing took place in that part. That's why baptism is so important. That's why when we receive the Lord, I mean, I, I get it, it's, it's, it's a very special time. But I'm of that, like, let's go. You believe? Let's just do it. Like, this is that. What just happened to you right now? You believe the word? Then you've been washed by the word, so let's wash. Let's do it. Right? Right? I mean, and I get the, the, uh, the, the 
five or six week classes on baptism, but you know, John the Baptist wasn't doing that. You know, just repent. I repent. Okay, come here. Shh, right? There are so many people getting lined up. It wasn't like the six week course on, on baptism before he went in. Because you grow into salvation. You understand it. Just like a baby. It doesn't, you, don't, you don't explain to a baby all about life before they're born. You don't do a little toilet paper roll and just talk to the womb. Right? Because they grow into life. You and I grow into the understanding of walking in the Spirit. That's what it's all about. Let's keep on going. These are other verses to back up, and we're going to get into some, some, some interesting things here. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by God, because God shows you as the firstfruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So here it talks again about the work of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will sanctify us. It brings us new life. And you and I now are continually walking with the Spirit of the Lord inside us. To the sojourners, I just put that in parentheses because that's who it's talking to. People who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, set apart by the Spirit for obedience and for the sprinkling with the, sprinkling with the blood of Jesus the Messiah, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. So you see that you and I have been set apart by the Spirit. So there's a reason. Why do you want to be set apart? Why do you need to be holy? Why do you need to spend time in the tent? Right, We need to spend time in that tent, which I'm going to go much more into next week. So as the more time you spend in the tent, the more you understand the nature of God that's been given to you. And when you leave that place, you're empowered to walk out the nature of God, which is why it was the nature of God to make things that were unclean clean, which is why Jesus, who walking in the divine nature, could lay hands on the sick and they, were, they would recover. Why he would speak to those that were demon-possessed and they were instantly set free. Because he was set apart and he was holy. He wasn't just set apart, but he was set apart to carry the divine nature of God. You and I have been set apart, pulled from a life of sin, pulled from being unclean into clean, not just to say, like someone get out of the bath, ooh, I needed that, I was sweaty all day. You and I have been set apart. We've become clean so we could partake in the divine nature of God and the divine nature of God is going to bring a difference in the world today. Again, it's not just saying, oh, we're clean, like when you beg your kids to take a bath and finally they agree and they're like, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. You're like, I know, I told you that three days ago, right? When you're there, it's, just, it's not that kind of clean. You've been cleaned for a purpose. You have been cleaned to carry and be a part and partake in the divine nature of Yahweh himself, the, front, the one who is from everlasting, the one who spoke creation into being. You've been invited to partake in his divine nature. Again, that changes everything. Everything. Let's go here in Thessalonians. Let's, let's, let's dive into it. Now, he is writing specifically about something that, that is happening there, and he's addressing it, but we're going to relate it to us here in a second. Finally, then, brothers and sisters, we ask you and appeal in the Lord, we ask you and appeal in the Lord Jesus, just as you perceive from us the way you ought to walk and please God. But then he affirms them. He says, Hey, You've received from us the way you need to be walking, holy, in, uh, you know, in, in the holiness of God. Then he affirms him and says, as, as in fact you are walking, that you keep progressing more and more. So this needs to continually be on our mind. Remember last week, we talked about be mindful of how you walk. We need to be making sure that we are progressing more and more and more. And what's that? In the knowledge of, of, uh, of walking in the divine nature, partaking in the divine nature of God, what it means to be holy, what it means to be set apart. It just doesn't mean that, I mean, it, it, there's an element of that, but it just doesn't mean that you're no longer a part of that. It means that you've been given something to change and go back into those areas. Like, you've heard me reference this guy before. There's that one of the, the lead guitars from Korn became a Christian. Korn's not a good band. I wouldn't encourage you to listen to the lyrics at all. Uh, it'd never be played in my house, right? But... This guy became a born-again Christian, left, I forget for how long, Brian Welch, came back because the Lord said, I want you to go back into this. It shocked everyone. The, 
the guy got crucified by Christians over and over and over and over again. But what's this guy doing? Corn, Brian went back into corn, started playing because the Lord said, I want you to go back in. That verse became real to him. It says, not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Got the bass player saved, Fiddy. And now after every before and after every concert, they go out and they are praying for people and bringing salvation to the Lord in a place that Christians don't dare to walk. Right? They've been set apart but not set apart in a way that you can no longer go back there. But they've been set apart now to be like, hey, wait a minute, that's not the way I was, and I need to go back in and get other people out. In a different way, but they are ready for it. So let's just keep on going here. That you keep progressing more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through Lord Jesus. This, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. And right here, he's, this is where he, he's a... Uh, addressing an issue that's going on there, to abstain from sexual immorality, to know each of you how to gain control over his body in holiness and honor. Now, not in the passion of lust like the pagans who do not know God, and not to overstep his brother and take advantage of him in this matter. I'm going to pause because it was, there was a lot of adultery going on there, taking your, your brother's wife and all this stuff. And he was writing this, possess, learn how to control yourself, but here he's writing specifically about a certain topic and issue, but fill in the blank, whatever it is for us, that we need to abstain from whatever our weakness is. Because the, the will of God for us is sanctification. And we need to learn how to control our body in whatever, if we were written a letter from Paul, whatever this would be for us, we need to learn how to gain control over our body in holiness and honor. Whatever it is, possess your vessel with honor. Because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, as we told you before and solemnly warned you. For God did not call us to impurity, but to holiness. Consequently, the one who rejects this is not rejecting man, but God who gives, you, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So again, looking at this, the, the whole concept of what has been written here, that's why I just couldn't pick one or two verses because we had to get it in the context. Looking at the context, whatever it is that we need to gain control over, whatever it is, if we decide not to do that, then we are not rejecting God. But Paul puts a big, a big jab in there. He says, you're rejecting God who's given you his Holy Spirit to set us apart and be holy. But that's why there's hope. If, if we haven't hit the mark of perfection yet, congratulations, I'm glad you realize that we're not gonna be perfect till the time of Christ, but we need to continue to keep pressing in more and more to understanding what exactly it means to be holy, to be set apart. When God brought us out of one lifestyle and placed us here and clothed us with another, it wasn't to stay hiding out in the mountains and wait for him to return. It was to go back and bring the purity of Christ into an unpure area, whatever that looks like. And that's why you need to go two by two and have accountability and all this other good stuff. So we are going to go into an understanding of the temple again. And Ezekiel sees, we, we know this well, but we're, we're going to really paint a picture here. So Ezekiel sees this vision of the temple, of the house. And we're going to relate it to the church of today. Then he, and, underst and relate it to holiness. So back in the day to be holy, the holiness of God in order to even encounter the holiness of God, you had to be clean yourself, right? Then Jesus comes. And to the encounter of the holiness of God, you don't have to be clean. You can be unclean, but you just have to have a heart that's hungry for him. And when he comes and when clean touches you, you become clean. Holy, set apart. Jesus was holy. You and I have been invited to share in that exact nature. I'm going to talk more about that last week. Then he brought me back to the door of the house, and behold, water was flowing out from under the threshold of the house eastward, for the front of the house faced east. Now that has its own revelation, but I'm not going to get into that today. The water was flowing down from under the right side of the house, south of the altar. So you see this vision. We're going to get into this in a, in a bit. Water was coming to come under the door, and it was flowing out from the east. Just a little tidbit for fun. Eden, or the Garden of Eden was placed, or the garden was placed in the east of Eden. Here's the house. Anyways, that's just a bunny trail for you to hop down later, right? So here's his vision. He sees the house. He sees water coming out of it and is going. 
So you and I are now the house of the Lord, right? So if we're going to represent that, then right now there should be water flowing from underneath the threshold of the door of this church. Not that door right here, but the presence of us as we're all gathered together, water is flowing out from us. And that water just isn't when we have to huddle around in a group and move as a group, right? But whenever we, wherever we go, as we gather together, wherever we go, you need to remember, possess your vessel with honor, that there is water flowing from underneath the threshold of your door when you're at the wherever. Things that test your patience, water is flowing through. Things that test your anger, water is flowing through. Water is flowing through the door. Right? This is a picture of the spiritual temple. Let's keep on going. You can read the whole thing in context. He said to me, have you seen the Son of Man? Then he brought me to back to the bank of the river. And obviously we know, sorry, the, the water gets higher and higher and higher and higher. We know this, right? When I returned, behold, there were very many trees on one side and on the other along the bank of the river. Then he said to me, these waters go towards the eastern region. They go down to, they go down to the Arabah and enter the sea, the dead, which is the Dead Sea. When they arrive at the sea, all the waters of the sea will flow and become fresh. If you look up that word fresh, which I did, that's why I put my own little things there, it means healed. So when the waters that flow out from the temple of God touch what is dead, they'll become healed. Do we see that picture in Jesus? Whenever he touched something that was dead, what happened? It became healed. But it went out. Jesus went out. Where did people usually meet Jesus? He went to the temple to preach, but where did they meet Jesus? He went out to them, into the regions. He went out to all the regions. He went out and carried the water. The waters of the sea will flow and become fresh or healed. It will be that every living creature that swarms will live wherever the river goes. There will be a very great multitude of fish because this water goes there and makes the salt water fresh. So everything will be healed and lived where, live wherever the river goes. Everything will be healed and live wherever the river goes. Right? Ezekiel, and this is the last one, Ezekiel. On the river, on its bank, on the side, and that side, will grow every type of tree for food. Its leaf will not wither, its fruit will not fail, Jesus said, you will bear fruit that will remain, right? Here's, a, here's, here's the, uh, it's all tied into that. Its leaf will not wither, its fruit will not fail. It will bear new fruit every month. Rosh Kadesh, right there. It will bear new fruit every month because its waters flow out from the sanctuary. Its fruit will be food and its leaf will be for healing. Now let's understand this. Let's go back. You and I understand something here that we have now been the temple of the Lord, right? Blessed are you, Simon Peter. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, that I'm the Christ. On this truth that I'm the Christ, I'm going to build my church, right? So you and I are now the church. And the water, Pete, is resembling of the Holy Spirit, which we're going to get to in a second. We have all been given the Holy Spirit. So we've all been given the river that brings life to dead places. We've all been given the river that brings life to dead places. The Great Commission, what did it say? Go into all the nations and make disciples, right? Whoops, sorry, I did a my computer right here. Go into all the nations and make disciples. It's not write letters to all the nations and tell them to come here. Right? Go into all the nations and make disciples of all nations. The next one, Great Commission in the different... Go into all the world and preach the good news. And then it even says that signs and wonders will follow you there. That's what this Great Commission says. So it's go into, preach the good news, and as you preach, the Lord will perform mighty miracles to back up the preaching of the word. But there you have that whole thing. Go into all the world. The water did not stay in the temple in Ezekiel. Where did it go? It flowed out. Luke, the message of his name, Jesus, will be preached with authority to all nations. There it is again. The disciples were told to wait until the promised Holy Spirit comes from heaven and fills them with power. That's what Jesus said. He said, wait. Why? Because a house without water, you need the water. To fulfill the vision of Ezekiel, water needs to be flowing from our midst. And that water is the Holy Spirit. Je Jesus says this, Now whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Exactly like the temple in Ezekiel. 
If I believe in Jesus, out of my innermost being will flow rivers of living water. That's why it's important for us to go. Do I want people to come to church? 100%. But we have to understand that the time of ministry is, 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 is there. We come here. We are filled up. We praise the Lord. As a church body, we celebrate the Lord in his presence. Signs and wonders, miracles will break out. But then you and I are called to go out, bring the water of life. It says rivers of living water. Bring it into the community, into wherever we are. Touch what is unclean. Now, you, don't, you wouldn't say, hey, you're unclean. But the whole, the whole purpose, touch what is unclean, knowing that you've been given the Holy Spirit of God. And when you move, the life of the Lord will back you up because it's not my water, it's his water, it's his spirit that's doing the miracles. I'm just going out there and making sure my temple is there. Be holy as I am holy. You have been set apart to partake in the divine nature of God. See, look, you had to be pure or clean to come before God. Now the be holy as I am holy has a different purpose. To be in that position to release the power of God from our life. That's why you've been holy. That's why he wants your sanctification. Number one, he wants it so you can be with him and a part of his family. But he wants you to bear witness to his name. He wants you to. And so he said, I'm going to make you holy so you can really lame, cheesy thing, but there, so that you can be a billboard for who I am, the goodness of who I am, the love and mercy of who I am. This is why you've been set apart. We do this as we abide in the Father, spending time in the tent, because we are in Jesus, because we are in Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. I shared a picture, if you can think of a box within a box, and then it's us. It says, we abide within the Father because we are in Jesus. That's in Scripture. So think of it, we are in God, and he is in us because of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. So when it says, be holy as I am holy, you need to remember that you've been pulled from a life of sin, not to camp out and just wait till the return of Jesus, but to be like, oh my goodness, I've been pulled out of a life of sin. I've been clothed in something that's not my own, clothed, clothed in, 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 the, in, the, in the divine nature of God. I've been given the Holy Spirit of God that will take place. The picture of that, will me receiving him, will be rivers of living water flowing from my body. And as I'm flowing from my body, I go back out into those places. And where I walk, those that are hungry and seeking truth, the dead will become alive again because of Jesus Christ. That is why God says, be holy as I am holy. So you can carry his divine nature into the world, preach the good news of the gospel, and see change come because of him, who's, because of the power of God who's within us. It says the same, Jesus, same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead now dwells in you. The same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead now, now is in us to bring power to the nations, not to hide out. Pastor Todd, if you want to come up. Come up, I mean, sorry. Be holy as I am holy. 